Welcome to session four of Keys to Health, Wholeness, and Fruitfulness. In this session, we're going to try to understand why we have emotions, how to handle them, and how they can help us become healthy, whole disciples of Jesus, whose lives make a real difference. When Adam and Eve lost their relationship with God, they became orphans and experienced a whole host of new negative emotions, fear, shame, rejection, and guilt. Because we were born without that spiritual connection to God, we started out with that same orphan mindset. But now that we follow Jesus, our relationship with God has been restored. We are no longer orphans, and can choose to walk by the spirit rather than the flesh. As we do that, the fruit of the spirit will grow in us and will experience more positive emotions such as joy and peace. But we are all a bit of a work in progress. Although we know in our heads that we are not orphans, but dearly loved, secure, significant children of God, it can take a while for our hearts to catch up. And we know very well what it's like to have those same negative emotions. Jesus showed us how important it is to be honest about how we feel. He wept at the grave of Lazarus and he wept when he looked at Jerusalem. Rather frustratingly, emotions are not things we can turn on and turn off at will with a remote control like we do our television. They aren't like all the physical processes in our body, like walking or waving our hand, where we just make a conscious decision to do it. They're more like the way our heart beats or our immune system functions. It just happens. If you want to check that out, try this simple test. Now, think of someone you just don't like. Now, try not to look at somebody at this time. No, don't, don't do it. And decide that from now, you're going to like them. Let's try that. Is it working? No. You just can't do it. The good news is that God doesn't ask us to like people. He commands us to love them. Love isn't an emotion. It's a choice. If we make that conscious choice to love them, we may find that we'll eventually come to like them too. And right there you have a key principle concerning our emotions. Although you can't control them directly, you can change them over time. As you make a conscious choice to change what you can control, and you can control what you choose to believe. Emotions are a gift from God that function rather like that annoying red warning light on the dashboard of your car. The one that basically tells you to stop driving and call a very expensive mechanic. <laughs> when that light comes on, when you feel anxious, angry, or depressed, it's a warning. It's a warning sign that there is something you need to take a look at an adjustment that needs to be made. And if you're anything like me, you ignore the red light, hoping it will go away. It never does. And of course, ignoring it can lead to bigger problems over time. The appropriate response is to stop the car and find out what's wrong. When I trained as a doctor, there was very little teaching on emotional issues. The emphasis was on the Physical body, symptoms, signs, investigations, what you see under the microscope, medications to use, tablets, tablets, and more tablets. 
And it's important to say that negative emotions can be caused by physical things like hormones or a viral illness. Even the weather can play a part. Most negative emotions don't have a physical root, but are rooted in spirit or mind issues. Remember, we need to get to the root of the issue if we want to sort it out. In our experience, one of the main causes of negative emotions is unforgiveness. Very few of us have understood what forgiveness really is and why we are commanded to do it. So what's the worst thing that anyone ever did to you? Think about that. So why should you forgive them? The blunt answer is quite simply, because God commands you to. In Colossians 3 and verse 13, it says, forgive as the Lord forgave you. He commands you to do it because he loves you and knows it is good for you. In 2 Corinthians 2, verses 10 to 11, we discover why it's, why it's good for us. If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwist us. For we are not unaware of his schemes. Unforgiveness gives the enemy a foothold in your life, an ability to hold you back that could also conceivably be a doorway to illness. It also affects your thinking negatively, another root of physical problems. So why don't we just forgive them? The reason we find it so difficult is because we want to see justice done, don't we? Of course. We want, to pay for, uh, we want them to pay for what they did. We think that in commanding us to forgive, God is asking us to sweep what was done under the carpet to say it was okay. In fact, it's quite the opposite to that. Look carefully at what he says. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. He promises that if you hand the matter over to him, he will ensure that it is not swept under the carpet at all. When you forgive, although you are letting the person off your hook, you are not letting them off God's hook. When you choose to forgive, you are taking a step of faith to trust God, to be the righteous judge who will make everything right by demanding full payment for everything done against you. Nothing will be swept under the carpet. Everyone who sinned against you will have to stand before God and explain it. Either it will be paid for by the blood of Jesus if the person follows Jesus, or they will have to face the judgment of God if they don't. So you can make the choice to hand all that pain and those demands for justice over to God, safe, in the knowledge that justice will be done. In the meantime, you can walk free of it. So how do we forgive? Jesus says we need to forgive from the heart. That means being emotionally honest about what was done to us and just how much it hurt us. We have to face the pain and the hate that we feel we have to be honest with God. In the steps to freedom in Christ, we recommend you do it like this. Lord, I choose to forgive whoever it is for what they did or failed to do, which made me feel this way or that way. And then you just tell God about every hurt and every pain. This isn't easy but you do it in order to resolve, completely resolve this issue and get rid of the pain that you've been carrying around. We will continue to suffer spiritual torment, negative emotions, and possibly even physical illness 
until we forgive. We can't move on from the past until we forgive. We won't be able to do what God has prepared for us to do until we forgive. We won't be fruitful disciples until we forgive. I wasn't aware of these problems before we got married. He had a drug addiction. He had an alcohol addiction. He had a gambling addiction. He was violent um, and also he was unfaithful. There was one time he had met a group of people in the local pub and he'd gone home with one of the women. And uh, I and it ended up that I knew the husband of this particular woman I'd babysat for him when he was a little boy. I hated how I, fe how I felt. I didn't like the feeling of repulsion that was in me. And I knew the only way to rid myself of that level of anguish and re all of it was so horrible was to forgive. So I got my book, my Freedom in Christ step book, and I, Lord, I choose to forgive Tex for going home with this woman for having sex with her. I went through all of that, which made me feel, got to the which made me feel. So I did it all nice and sweetly and said, repulsed, sick, sad. And it was suddenly like there was this, I thought that was gonna be so horrible, like vomit or something, it was so horrible in me. And I thought, I can't do this nicely. I can't describe how I feel in a sweet, polite way. And I said, Father, I'm gonna to have to swear I can't do this, I'm really gonna to have to swear really badly. But I felt so amazing, because it was like lancing a revolting boil and having all of that stuff out and gone. And then the beautiful bit, I ask you to heal my damaged emotions. And, I, and he did. <laughs> and I'm a really well person. And I can tell these stories and <laughs> people are like that, but I'm free. So several years on, we'd got divorced and several years on, the phone rang at home and it was his sister crying and Tex had been found dead. And I was asked if I would give the eulogy at his funeral. I talked very honestly about him, acknowledged how hard life had been with him, but how happy life could be with him and explained that when Tex believed the labels that, he was, that were put on him by the world, he behaved how they had seen him. So he'd be in prison, he'd be under probation, he'd have psychiatric help, drugs workers. And I explained to them, but when he believed the truth of who he was in Christ, i.e. the truth of what God had said about him, he was completely different. So I'm going to tell you who he was in Christ. He was a child of God. He was a part of the true vine, Jesus. He was a channel of his life. When I'd finished, the pastor, the Welsh pastor there, just looked at me and said, I've never heard anyone speak so beautifully about someone before. May I pray for you in Welsh? It was like, oh yes, please. And it was lovely. It was lovely. And I honoured him. My car is getting quite ancient. It's been incredibly reliable, but every so often that red warning light comes on. And my first thought is to wonder how much it's going to cost, or even whether I'm finally going to have to get a new car. It's quite a scary thought. And to be honest, I do tend to ignore it for a while and hope it will go away but of course it never does. And ultimately it would be better to investigate the problem. When the red warning light of our emotions flares up, how do you think we can start an investigation that will help us get to the bottom of the problem? So let's look now at the subject of depression, which affects many people. And most of us will go through periods of time when we feel down or sad. And when we go through trauma or bereavement or some other loss, then it would be surprising if we didn't feel sad. However, a diagnosis of depression comes when you feel persistently sad for weeks or months, rather than just for a few days. Don't think, however, that a diagnosis means staying depressed is inevitable. It isn't. Don't let a medical label define you, define who you are, or discourage you from thinking that you can recover. When you're depressed, you might find it difficult to concentrate. Daily tasks might seem difficult, and often you'll lack energy and motivation. 
you lose interest in things that you'd normally enjoy. And you might sleep badly or find that you lose your appetite. And sometimes thoughts might even come into your mind of ending your life as a way out. Now these symptoms are very real and you can't just snap out of it. It's important to be clear that depression can have a purely physical root. For example, having an underactive thyroid gland or certain hormone problems or side effects of medication. So checking with your doctor is a good idea. And there's talk about in the medical press about serotonin and whether there's a physical problem with serotonin. And that's the problem that causes the depression. But it may also be that it's the way that we think that changes the serotonin levels. It's difficult to know what causes what. And today I've put my serotonin earrings on as a special recognition of the role of serotonin in depression. However, for most people, there is no clear physical cause identified. And it would then be appropriate to look for a root cause at a mind or spirit level. So when I see someone in the surgery who's depressed, I take time to find out their story because that helps work out the root. So some good questions can be, when did you first feel like this? What happened then? What kind of thoughts go through your mind? Do you have nightmares? What are they about? Has anything traumatic happened in your life, even a long time ago? What was home like? What did your family mem members model to you as a child? Now, if you suffered some kind of sexual abuse as a child, you probably felt powerless, dirty or ashamed. And you may still feel like that now because the lies and negative thoughts have become part of your programming. If you believed that God wasn't there for you in the trauma, then you probably question his love and his, and his value of you now. The root might be linked with a loss in the present, maybe a job or a relationship or a status. For example, if you've come to believe that your success as a person depends on how much you earn or how much you achieve, and then you lose your job, then you might feel that you've lost your worth and lost your value as a person, and you probably feel depressed. Now, in both these cases, the root is a faulty belief, and that can be changed. You're not dirty, powerless or guilty. God was there and hated what happened to you. You can't change your past, but you can choose to walk free from it. You're not defined by career success or how much money you have. You're defined by what Father God says about you. Now, my patients find it really helpful when they understand that the real problem is a faulty belief because that gives hope for change. They can do something about it. You might not be able to change your circumstances or your past, but you can change how you see them. And you can change those faulty beliefs for ones that are genuinely true. Now, if you're becoming aware of faulty beliefs that you're carrying, remember to write them down in the truth and lies section at the back of your participants guide for future reference. So how can we get well from depression? Well, I'd like to illustrate with some keys from my own story. I had difficult pregnancies. Um, I was physically exhausted. I'd been battling fear and anxiety for many years. And when our youngest child was five months old, I sort of crashed. It was hard to function. It was hard to think straight. Everything seemed hopeless. I was irritable, frightened, weepy, and I'd got to the point where it felt that life was difficult to carry on with. On the advice of friends, I went to see my doctor uh, who diagnosed depression and gave me antidepressants. Now, I didn't want to take them. I wanted God to heal me. So I put them on a shelf and I looked at them for three weeks and nothing changed. So I decided to give it a go. And after about 10 days, it was like a light came on in my head. I could think more clearly, I felt more positive, and I had more energy. And I was actually genuinely shocked at the difference that they made to me. 
So antidepressants can help us function better so that we can then make the necessary changes to resolve the root issues. But medication does only treat the surface symptoms and the danger is that we're so pleased to feel better that we don't actually take the next step and address the deeper issues. So my next step was to seek counselling help. I started to talk about myself and think about my story with the help of someone else. I'd spent a lot of my life believing that I had to hold everything together, but I started to realise that it was OK to have stuff. It was OK not to have everything sorted. It was OK to cry in church. It was OK to need help. Like Jesus, King David in the Psalms was honest about what he felt. Now the word depression isn't used in the Bible, but David expressed it like this. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? And he goes on to say, put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my saviour and my God. So he admits honestly how he feels, and then he makes a declaration of what's actually true often accompanied by praise and rejoicing. I started to realise then that I had some really deeply embedded lies in my thinking. I'd been living with an orphan mindset, searching for affirmation and value, feeling that I had to please people to be of worth, feeling I had to achieve to be loved. And I also had many fears and anxieties, including a fear of death, so my body was on constant high alert with feelings of anxiety, palpitations, not sleeping. And all the time I tried to mask it and carry on. Now Jesus sometimes asked people if they wanted to get well. And that's a really important question. Depression can become part of our identity. And being ill can also bring us support and love, care even money, and we might not be willing to give those things up. The thought of getting better can be quite scary. But I made the decision that I did want to be well and I was willing to do whatever it took. So I, address, I addressed any possible spiritual roots by going through the steps to freedom in Christ, and that's a really important first step. I'd been honest about my feelings but now I needed to bring my thinking in line with what was actually true rather than what felt true. It takes time and effort to renew our minds, but it really works. So I meditated on truth from the Bible. I wrote out declarations of truth about who I really was and what my father thought about me. I even wrote Bible verses on the walls of our house, silver pen in the hallway to remind me all day what the truth was. I would read the Psalms at night when anxiety tried to come in. It took months, but I, but I persevered. And I still remember that time when suddenly the fear left in an instant. So now I was well and I decided it was time to stop the medication. But two weeks later, I started to feel down again, feel depressed. So I asked God what to do about it. And he said to me that Satan wanted me to believe that I was depressed again. And that if I agreed with him, I would be. There's power in agreement. So I refused to agree with what he was whispering to me. And I've been completely well from depression for 18 years now. I want to share with you a few of the keys that I learned for staying well in that time. So firstly, friends who love you enough to be honest, real and challenging, as well as supportive, are a blessing. It's in the honesty, it's the, in the honesty and challenge in a place where you feel safe and loved that you can face your darkest secrets. Secondly, worship really helps in worship, I'm directing my attention away from myself and towards God. I spent hours listening to and singing along with worship music, songs that had words of truth. Make sure that your life has 
balance and includes things like exercise, fun things, creative things, being outside in God's creation, even if you don't feel like it. Laugh. The joy of the Lord really is my strength. So look for good things. Choose to dwell on positive things. Watch funny television programs. Be wise who you spend time with. Some people drain us of life and energy. Others fill us up and we feel better when we're with them. Be careful what you say. If I always go around saying, I am depressed or I am down, speaking out negative things, then it's likely that that's what you will be. So ask your close friends what you sound like. How do you come across? Now, that's not to pretend that we're okay when really we're not. Rather, it's to choose to speak what God says is true instead of what we feel. So I can say, I'm a precious daughter of God who is loved, even though today I feel alone and unlo unlovable. Or I have not received a spirit of fear, but of power, love and a sound mind. Even though today my mind is full of negative, fearful thoughts. Look outside of yourself to the needs of others. Volunteer to help the homeless walk dogs from a rescue shelter. Write to someone in prison. Maybe even if you don't feel like it. I um, took very, several attempts of my life. I just wanted to die. I didn't enjoy living. I didn't like who I was. I didn't like who was around me. I didn't enjoy anything. But um, they did um, give me a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder um, on top of emotionally unstable disorder and various other anxieties and depressions and everything else. But I was told that it was a diagnosis that I couldn't overcome. Um, I had to live with it and I, I couldn't cope with that. And I had a friend who we used to get up to no good with and she became a Christian and I'd bump into her now and again and she would always share the gospel with me and I would always reject it. So I asked if she would pick me up on the Sunday to go to church. The pastor was talking and I wasn't really listening and then I, I just heard him talking about the mental illness and how, you know, how we can overcome that. And it just really gave me hope. I said to my friend one night after many tears, I said, write out that salvation prayer for me then and I'll take it home. As soon as I'd finished it, I just felt this, this lifting. This, I just, I felt free and lifted and, and, and light and I was happy. I just, I just felt like everything that was holding me down all my life had been taken out of me in that instant and I couldn't stop smiling and I was just so happy. And I felt for the first time in my life, in 36 years, I felt freedom. To just read the Bible and know that what I was reading could be applied into my life and used, I was just so on fire for God. For me to go on the Freedom in Christ course, it helped me to understand that the, you know, there is, there is an enemy, there is the devil is real and he will try and put things in our minds. I sat, sat before my psychologist. He was gobsmacked. He couldn't speak. I've never seen a psychologist stuck for words before. He couldn't speak. He was just, his, his face was, everything was just like, wow, what's happened to you? The psychologist wrote me off there. I was not in the mental health system anymore. They, they, they could not find a reason for me to be there. You know, I was discharged from the services. Since I've been a Christian, I've never had to go to the doctor with any mental health issues. I've never had to take any tablets for that. Um, I use the word of God now when I feel anxious or stressed. I see my, um, my miraculous healing and deliverance as initially as from God. Um, he did the, you know, he's done the most work, but there is um, a daily working with him in that. I used to go to church and I would get these voices coming in my head still and um, I would get vivid um, pictures and stuff which were not nice. For example, if, if there's something in my mindset telling me that I'm stupid, I'm ugly, I'm not good enough, I can't do it, I'm useless, I will then use scriptures. I, you know, I, I speak to my mind and I tell it, I ask the Lord to renew my mind daily. Um, and that, that, you know, that normally does it. So in summary, as we grow as disciples of Jesus and keep believing what he tells us is true, then we can expect the balance of emotions to shift from negative to positive. And God's peace will assure us that we're walking with him.
The joy of the Lord will be our strength. But it won't happen without a relentless commitment to believe the truth, despite what we feel and despite our circumstances. Mary has been very open with us in sharing her own story of how she came out of depression, which of course is something that affects a lot of people. In this Pause for Thought, we'd like you to consider how you might begin to help someone who is suffering from depression. So as usual, we have seven great keys to take home. One, negative emotions are a gift from God to alert us to faulty beliefs. Two, we can't control emotions directly, but we can change them over time as we choose to believe the truth. Three, unforgiveness is a very common root cause of emotional and physical ill health. Four, God commands us to forgive so that we can stop hurting, prevent the enemy from holding us back and receive healing. Five, when we choose to forgive from the heart, we are trusting God to ensure that justice is done whilst we walk free. Six, depression that does not have a physical root can be resolved as we address the root causes, get appropriate medical input, deal with any spiritual issues and renew our mind. And seven, it's important not to get our identity from our illness. Be honest about what we gain from it and make a decision, a definite decision to want to be well. Thanks for joining us today. In the next programme, we'll move on to looking at a crucial gift that God has trusted us with, the ability to make choices. Thank you.